Better be here. I'm <laughs> shooting at my job. Yeah. It's available to any town. It's available to any landowner in any town. And on the ICWS site. And uh, these things probably be going on at some restaurant in Madison. Yeah. 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 I will. We try to continually update and get this thing going here. I've got a nice set of maps for the Western Farm Center for Lincolnville yeah. and for Lincolnville and the surrounding towns that talks about all of the factors and everything else. And they're a little bit time to fill Steve, in the if questions. Help. Are, they, are they through this? The viewers, yeah. if I turn part of the lights off, but I'm not sure it would help you to be able to see. I got this. Yeah, it's perfect. Dave, Jimmy, Dave yeah. Kinney, our town manager. Dave Perfectly. Kinney, Steve Walker. Nice, nice yeah. to meet you. So I go way back with Lincolnville. I was actually the consultant with Jones Associates that did the work for Charles Colley up on. Uh, oh, my God. oh, God, yeah. Oh, my <laughs> gosh, that's right. Um, yeah, I did a lot for MBNA back in the days in a former life. But anyway, um, sorry to be late. Thank you for having me. Um, this very interesting times to be doing beginning with Habitat. I uh, started back in the early 2000s when the program was just getting going and then was in the land trust community for about eight years um, and have recently returned. And it's interesting now having a biodiversity crisis and a climate crisis all happening at once and working with towns to do conservation planning is certainly a key time to do it. Um, I told you my Charles Colley story. I um, have also been in town planning department for many years and um, utility land trust. I am on my planning board in my hometown of Brunswick and also a town councilor. Um, I put this presentation, hopefully it'll be brief. And um, if I missed anything or if there's topics you all want to talk about that aren't included, happy to do it. Um, you can stop me at any time if you have questions. Without further ado, let's jump in. Um, folks know IFNW, you know us from our hunting and fishing and public access roles, um, but we see that supporting local communities meet our objectives is, is key now, and that's where this program fits in, is to try to help you accomplish statewide conservation goals um, in the protection of Maine's inland fish and wildlife resources. So when I say inland fish and wildlife, what does that mean? Most people, of course, IFNWs, moose, deer, grouse, you name it, the game species. But there's actually um, more than 15,000 species we're uh, responsible for by states, by the legislative mandate. Um, and as you can see here, most of those are non-game, which beginning with habitat program focuses on. Um, a big challenge we have, of course, Maine has, even though uh, we have a very small um, area um, globally, when you consider it globally, the diversity covers almost 20 degrees of latitude, something similar to, from uh, Poland to northern Finland, if you think of Europe. And in that, we have a multitude of habitat types, natural community types. We've got species reaching their northern limits 
um, down in the central, southern, central, and coastal areas. We have species um, reaching their southern limits, of course, things like lynx and blackback woodpeckers and things like that up in the boreal um, forests of the north. So we're a very diverse state. And given our historic settlement patterns, um, most of our growth, most of our population uh, overlaps with those high areas of, of diversity where those different ecotones converge. There we go. So what tools do we have uh, for maintaining all those inland fish and wildlife species on the landscape? You probably all heard of Maine's Endangered Species Act. This is sort of the uh, backstop or point of last resort we have in our toolbox. We don't like listing things. We currently have 52 species, and before this legislative session coming up, we're looking at uh, more than 20 potential additions, um, and that's significant. That's we, we hope to avoid listing because it's a reactive process, it's a legal process, um, and it's not the easiest to work with. Usually it's, it can be punitive. So as an alternative, um, several years ago, 2005 was the start of our sort of comprehensive planning for wildlife for at-risk species, non-game species in particular. Um, instead of a, a comprehensive plan like a municipality has, this is our state wildlife action plan and we're charged uh, by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, our sort of federal overseers, to put one of these together every 10 years. Um, currently, the 2015 update, we've got 378 species, what we call of greatest conservation need. These are species that through our uh, biological experts, our taxa experts, we've seen uh, significant declines, either in numbers or in habitat availability or both. Um, and just like a town's comprehensive plan, it, our state wildlife action plan prioritizes the work we do as a department in terms of non-game issues. So surveys and inventories, research of course, conservation management, and then education and outreach. Um, beginning with habitat fits into the last two bullets conservation and management, hoping to stimulate uh, local conservation efforts especially, and then education and outreach, coming to uh, municipalities across the state to provide services, planning services, data needs, things of that nature, so that each one of our towns can help us um, achieve the goals in this statewide plan. So now, um, things have gotten a lot more complicated <laughs> with climate. And we've, you know, when we as biologists think through, okay, climate change and biodiversity crisis, what factors do we need to consider? And there's a multiple, multiple ways we need to look at it. First, of course, direct impacts to species and their habitats. And these are pretty clear cut. Air temperatures are getting hotter, water temperatures, both coastal and inland waters uh, temperatures are getting hotter. Precipitation we've seen is radically changing. Um, increased storms and flooding, sea level rise, nearshore acidification. You've probably heard of all of these um, in the press recently or in, in media. And each of these, of course, has direct impacts on habitat function. Then there, the, second, the secondary um, or indirect impacts of climate. Um, for thousands of <coughs> years since the glaciers retreated, uh, Maine's plants and animals had a fairly stable climate. Now with the changes we're seeing, the climate weirdness, if you will, we're seeing changes in our growing season. We're seeing uh, changes in habitat makeup, the plants and animals, how they interact on the landscape as physical conditions of those habitats change. We're seeing species interaction change as um, ranges shift and habitat quality for one species may um, benefit that species more than others typically in that habitat. And then we're seeing these mismatches, these cues where, you know, things like snowshoe hair pictured here um, have evolved to turn white in the winter because they're camouflaged, but when we don't have as much snow on the ground, they're pretty much toast if a coyote comes around. And then on top of those, um, 
as biologists, we need to think about, okay, with these two factors, what are sort of the synergistic or what's, you know, the larger impact overall as you dump in these uh, different factors on the environment. And certainly habitat loss and fragmentation is nothing new, but as I think Maine was what, the second, um, second to North Carolina in terms of people moving in over the past couple of years from out of state. So we're gonna see probably more and more people coming up here. We're a great place. We're gonna have a comfortable climate as compared to you know the Southeast or Southwest. Um, we're seeing an increase in invasive species. Certainly we're not at the level of Massachusetts or states to our South, but we're seeing more species coming in and they're getting a foothold um, with changing habitat conditions. Increased diseases, you've probably heard about winter ticks. Um, we got good news today, the results of our annual survey show a decline in winter ticks killing moose, but still it's a growing problem and still affecting our moose herd. Um, and then pollution, of course, with more rain events, more storm events, you get more upland runoff, hitting our streams, hitting our coastal water bodies, and once you start getting um, nitrogen, phosphorus, you know what happens, we start uh, getting die-offs of shellfish in the ocean and we start getting um, algal out outbreaks in our great ponds. So, didn't want to start off depressing everybody, but um, this is how we need to, this is how we need to think as sort of a modern today um, state wildlife agency and what we need to wrestle with. So back in 2014, um, we ran all those 378 species of greatest conservation need I talked about in the State Wildlife Action Plan, and then some, because we did 442 total. We ran these um, through a professional scientific screening process, if you will, where we had 76 scientists of all different, specialized in all different taxa um, throughout New England. They weren't just Mainers, most of them were, but to get at some of the stuff we needed to go a little further afield. Um, and reviewing those stressors that I just ran you through, um, came to the conclusion, as you can see here, 37% uh, of those species, high vulnerability to climate change, 38% moderate, and what does that mean? Well, the high is striking enough, greater than 66% loss of the species range or population size in the next 50 to 100 years. So as people were charged by the state legislature to manage inland fishery, fish and wildlife, um, it makes our job a little more complicated. So that's where you guys come in. Um, we need uh, everybody on board and we are here to support any local actions that can affect conservation on the ground um, and habitat quality maintenance on the ground. Um, of course, habitat loss is currently the number one issue outside of climate change, being on top of that. Our state has more than 400 organized towns, as you know, each one um, basically making independent land use decisions, planning decisions, where growth areas are, where they're not. Um, a lot of towns just uh, default to state minimum zoning uh, requirements, which for the most part, were put together in the 70s and 80s before climate was even a thing. Um, most towns have, of course, limited resources, limited staff. Uh, it's code enforcement officers who aren't wildlife biologists or um, natural resource managers having to play the role of uh, decision makers. Um, and, you know, we don't often see large development projects. So, typical small subdivision in Lincolnville or a um, commercial site or solar array or what have you going in locally unless it triggers a large DEP, Department of Environmental Protection application that we can sort of comment on, we don't see it. So beginning with Habitat is here to try to provide the data and the information that you folks would need locally to see, okay, what's important? How do we prioritize? How can we affect our resources on the ground that we have jurisdiction over? Um, beginning with Habitat is totally voluntary. We're not here to tell you how to do things or what to do. We just provide 
the information and um, suggestions and we're happy to follow up. Uh, we work with towns to complete comprehensive plans, open space plans, ordinance updates, you name it. But again, you're in the driver's seat. Fortunately, um, you guys are already in the right mindset. This is from your 2001 comprehensive plan. 89% of the residents believe that Lincolnville's foremost feature is its environment, quiet beauty, clean air, open space, water resources, wildlife, woods, and conservation efforts. Asked what the most important goals are for the town. Again, in 2001, 83% chose preserving rural character and 80% chose protecting the natural environment. Um, this is echoed across the state of Maine. Almost every town comp plan has similar results. That's why we live in Maine. We love our natural environment and we want to keep it safe and functional. Um, fortunately, um, the department has since the early 2000s recognized that we need to get appropriate tools to municipalities to help them out. So there's as little guesswork as possible. Um, this report, which I believe is still on our website, was put together by U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service and the Humane Wildlife Ecology Department, and it basically provides a blueprint for, okay, what are the most important features of the landscape to look at in terms of habitat function, overall habitat resiliency, and sort of a blueprint for what habitat could be as we grow or what the important elements to conserve are as we grow and then figured out growth areas um, and ordinances around that model. It was designed for coastal communities, rural communities, city of Portland, you name it. It's, it's very modifiable and uh, pretty straightforward. And that was what led to beginning with habitat. Um, where we are today. And beginning with Habitat, before I dive into details here, we are not just IFNW. Um, we made the intentional decision to include as broad an array of resource agencies and NGO partners as possible so that we're all delivering the same message, all doing the same data quality and assurance checks, and um, providing the same messaging uh, to our local partners. And again, I'll just keep rolling if you don't stop me to ask questions. So if you have any, don't, don't hesitate. Um, the first and sort of primary function we have is data delivery. And in this tube, and it sounds like you already have some, we provide a series of map sets covering those landscape elements that were in that scientific report I showed you. Um, water resources, of course, where we highlight orange lines are native brook trout habitat, we show drainage divides, we show um, sand and gravel aquifers, we overlay the typical shoreland zoning um, polygons on significant wildlife habitats, and then we also include suggested riparian buffers around other surface water features that may not automatically fall under resource protection to show what's important, to show what is needed for habitat purposes. Map two is where we summarize um, our survey results and Maine Natural Areas Program survey results in the region. What we know about rare plant occurrences, rare animal occurrences, um, significant wildlife habitat. Um, I will point out, you know, we have these large deer wintering areas still mapped up and down the coast. I think you'll see in the next few months, IFNW is certainly backing away from prioritizing deer wintering areas where we have of deer on the landscape. So um, those are going to be pulled way back to central, northern, and way down east Maine. Um, so I wouldn't get hung up on deer winter areas in the town of Lincolnville. Um, and then the third primary map is where we show existing habitat conditions. Um, conserved lands, which of course Lincolnville has a lot of. We are pretty blessed with a state park and um, local land trust contribution. Um, as well as aerial photos snipping out development areas to try to highlight large blocks of forest that are still remaining on the landscape that might become local priorities for various reasons that I'll get into. 
And uh, not only do we have hard copy maps, as you were referencing earlier, we have mul a multitude of online resources for you. Um, interactive map viewer, you can zoom, click, identify, all the stuff you can typically do on an online map viewer of all the resources in those first three maps. We have a stream viewer, which I'll show a little more detail of, showing um, perched culverts, small dams, things blocking aquatic habitat passage that you may want to consider for future grant applications. We've worked hard to try to provide assistance to municipalities to fix those things. Um, and then you can order digital um, GIS data if you have a local GIS system or order more copies of the maps whenever you want. So data is one. Other services, of course, beyond that, um, presentations like this, workshops. We have a landowner biologist who can come out if you've got somebody with significant acreage that's looking for um, wildlife management ideas or suggestions. He's on call. We've got on, on our website a library of ordinance tools, um, an example, open space plans and things like that that other towns have developed. Um, we are standing by to help um, review any plans that you're drafting to give you suggestions. Um, and then hopefully, we were hoping that um, a big federal law, the Recovering America's Wildlife Act, was going to come through. It has not yet. Um, but once we have the funds, we hope to pr provide small grants to communities for completion of open space plans, land conservation, habitat restoration, things of that nature. All right, so let's get back to Lincolnville. Um, this is from your last comprehensive plan. Water is the most valuable resource we possess, whether locked into the ground or flowing through our streams and brooks, wetlands, lakes, or ponds. This resource, is, this resource provides a variety of valuable services to our community. It certainly does. And the first one I want to point out, um, one of my favorite species on the landscape now, eastern brook trout. I try to highlight these in every town I go to because, as you see this map here, the red and orange, this is the um, naturally, natural origins of eastern brook trout going all the way down to South Carolina. Where you see the red and orange, they've blinked out. Where you see the gray, they're completely gone, um, no longer present. So what's left are high peaks down here, um, northern, the northern New York and Maine being the hot spot for um, the remaining population of eastern brook trout. Um, they're under a lot of pressure with runoff, with lack of buffer to uh, streams, um, with rising water temperatures. These guys are a top priority for the department right now. And we think of them as a forest species, although they live in streams without being embedded in a large forest block, they're not going to have the cold groundwater, they're not going to have the woody material falling into the streams, making the pools and riffles. Um, they need a good, healthy stream buffer. Um, so in Lincolnville, on, you'll see on these maps, um, map one, we've highlighted the streams where we know brook trout occur in that orangey color. I apologize for how close it is to the pinkish. Um, a few of your local streams, Kendall Brook, Duck, Duck Trap, of course, I'm not going to talk salmon, but they're there too. Um, Tucker Brook, Black Brook, Wiley Brook, and tributaries to Coleman Pond, there's a few others. Um, these are areas that the department prioritizes for funding and for restoration. So any local efforts, um, ideas about culvert replacements, things of that nature, expanding buffers along the streams. We're here to help, and we can even bring funding to the table um, for some of those activities. I mentioned the stream viewer before. Um, I wanted to show you some of the functions on that. I highlighted a culvert here on Minnow Brook. Um, and when you click on it, when you get on the stream viewer, and you zoom into town, you can click on these things, and you'll actually can see the inlet and outlet of the culvert. So you can see, you know, fish aren't going to blink that. Um, color-coded red as an as a issue um, crossing. You can see also detailed crossing information, what kind of pipe it is, how long it is. We do this primarily for public works and, and road crews uh, to help municipalities. 
how to sort of prioritize which of these things to replace for these type budgets. Um, you'll also see what fish species are there. We have a whole series of different species that you click on and off. Um, and then other habitat considerations like um, erosion issues we've identified and things like that. So that's one tool to help you prioritize with local trout habitat. Um, and then ordinance tools and things we've seen across the state that are effective and we certainly promote. Um, Stream Smart is a program, hopefully some of you have heard about that. It's also linked on our website. It's like beginning with habitat, but focused solely on uh, aquatic habitat restoration. And it talks about how best to design and size culverts to specific situations to make them as habitat friendly as possible not just for aquatic species, but also riparian critters like turtles and mink and things like that that are gonna cruise along um, stream corridors. We stress the importance of expanding, expanding stream protection zones to all streams in town. Um, Lincolnville has uh, enhanced stream protections for a few brooks um, beyond the state minimums. The state minimums in shoreland zoning now only apply to below the confluence of two perennial streams. And then the upper watershed streams or first order streams don't get any formal protection under um, shoreland, typical shoreland zoning. If the towns wanna go over and above that, which we strongly suggest, you have the legal authority to do that and can do that um, with a vote, certainly of town members and an ordinance change. We strongly consider anything that has brook trout in it, uh, based on our surveys, that towns look to adopt a 100 foot no disturbance buffer on either side of that stream. Um, and what that does is it, it keeps the shading in place, it allows for the woody debris to drop into the stream, um, it protects runoff flowing down into the stream by giving that separation zone. Um, incentives for minimizing impervious surfaces, do we really need all the parking? is required in most ordinances now. Are there ways to give people um, credits for reducing parking and expanding something else or um, having more flexibility in codes? Uh, and there are examples of that. Restoration grants, like I said, our stream viewer, take a look at that, look at problem culverts in Lincolnville. If they're on a priority brook trout stream, you are eligible for um, grants to help replace those culverts. And right now through the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law and other things that are coming down, um, there's a lot of money in the state to assist municipalities. And then of course, work with landowners to promote um, riparian protections and your uh, local land trust to acquire and fee um, some of these areas. You've done a great job on duck trap and some of those streams, but um, other streams are equally as important. Sure. Um, so where does that 100 foot buffer come from? Why 100 foot? Because a lot of the land that's, that's minimum. We'd love to see more. <laughs> but <laughs> biologically, um, that was sort of the minimum we feel for, our department feels for tree fall and for shading and um, for water quality benefits. But certainly uh, the more the better, because these are actually forested species. Yeah, yeah, we thought let's start with something reasonable that towns and landowners might see the uh, value in doing. Um, you tell folks, you know, we want to see a 200 foot buffer on their streams and not as many doors open. <laughs> so that's, not, that's a policy? That's a policy, yeah, okay. yeah. This is what I'm referencing on these are potential ordinance changes you can make locally. And then beyond the streams themselves, um, these headwater wetlands, these groundwater seeps of which you have a lot feeding your streams, this is what keeps the ground, the stream water cold, these discharge sites. And unfortunately, you know, they're not considered wetlands of special significance by the state. So DEP doesn't give them the attention we feel they deserve. Um, they're often overlooked. A lot of them are being filled and lost. Um, mitigation isn't required uh, through DEP unless you 
have considerable impact, over 15,000 square feet in most cases. But there are um, ordinance examples in place in southern Maine and is there one in the mid coast? I can't think of any off the top of my head. But where um, the way DEP rules work now is if you you can fill up to 4,300 square feet of a wetland like this without a permit, without even notification to the state. Once you get above that, you're into permitting. Once you get above 15,000, the state requires mitigation. Most of that mitigation happens by a developer putting money into the Maine Natural Resource Conservation Program Fund, which means it could go anywhere in a large region for a grant to restore wetlands or preserve wetlands elsewhere. It doesn't necessarily come back to Lincolnville. So what, uh, when there was a state planning office, um, what they came up with to address this is a local, a model local ordinance that towns can adopt that doesn't change the DEP requirements, but can do things like for impacts under that mitigation threshold, mm -hmm have an impact fee locally that then you can apply to riparian habitat protection, culvert replacement, wetland restoration. Um, and we have examples of that ordinance on our, on our website, but it's a good way to stop local losses of wetlands, which um, we're certainly seeing a lot of. All right, more on water. Um, this, these are some pretty eye-opening statistics. Nearly a fifth of the world's dragonflies and damselflies are at risk of extinction. And uh, this should be concerning because they are a great indicator of water quality. Um, there are two, well, there's actually um, four that are endemic to this part of the world. And two of those occur right here in Lincolnville. And jump into them. The New England bluet, which we had, we knew of 23 populations. In 2019, we could only reconfirm 11 of those populations. They like, and this is the north end of Kicker Pond here, but you can see this aquatic bed type um, vegetation here, and um, those emergent aquatic beds is, are what they thrive in and what they look for. And unfortunately, when you start getting a lot of uh, dock and pier um, development along the shorelines or loss of riparian habitats, uh, that can uh, impact their, their population. So something to, something to, be, to look mm -hmm. for. And then the other one, Scarlet Bluet, um, we have over at Knight's Pond. Most of that, if it's not all in resource protection, a lot of it's conserved now. So that guy is probably pretty secure um, here in Lincolnville. All right, moving on to from aquatics to terrestrial systems. Um, I have a question about the bluebird. Yeah, please. Are there a lot of different yes. blue colors? Yes, there are, and they're. They're tough, they're tough to identify. I'm trying to think of some distinguishing characteristics of New England. Um, certainly you can sort them by size, but it's, it's a species you actually have to get in hand. But um, I bring up damselflies in this context because any of them, <laughs> you know, they're all declining. And having rich populations of odinase dragonflies and damselflies around says a lot about your local water quality. Um, and protecting habitat for those, you're protecting water quality, you're protecting the functioning of your, your great pond. All right, moving on to the terrestrial side of things. This is map three, our forest blocks, where we, of course, show the future lands in town and then highlight uh, other patches of forest that are unbroken by roads and development. We show you the acreage. Um, the importance of this is certainly multifold. Um, we think with all the climate stuff going on and planning to look for no regrets approaches to local planning. Things like riparian buffers, which I just went over. Yes, it might impede some ability to use land in that 100 foot zone, 
but 50 years from now, you're still going to have that clear, cool water. Same thing with large, unfragmented blocks. If you can prioritize some of these to conserve to the extent possible, working with landowners and using some of the tools that I'll go over, you're sequestering carbon, you're also protecting water quality, and you're providing habitat functions for a lot of those uh, forest species of greatest conservation need in our state wildlife action plan that are sort of blinking out as blocks in towns to our south um, start getting smaller and smaller and less and less connected. These also, you know, maintaining these are also going to be our future places we can hunt and fish. Um, and they're climate resilient. And this is a little uh, funky to explain, but this, this map is a web viewer that Nature Conservancy put together. And what they do, and this is sort of where climate conservation science is going, is that, you know, we don't know what species are going to be on the landscape 50 to 100 years from now. What we do know is that if we don't have the landscape functions conserved to some extent, diversity is going to go way down. So by looking at areas in terms of topography, which you have a lot of here in Lincolnville, um, habitat coverage, geological types, I do believe there's still some limestone in this neck of the woods. Um, adding those and overlaying those features together will tell you about where the most resilient um, portions of landscape are for future ecological functions. So this map blends all those features down and the darker the green, of course, the more resilient soil. Um, so you can see here sort of Kansas, part of Kansas Hills, but then going up into Lincoln Village, you'll start seeing where uh, some of these blocks really do play a role in um, habitat resiliency moving forward. And it may help you to prioritize, okay, which blocks are most important to steer development away from, where blocks that maybe we could sacrifice for growth areas or other purposes. Um, just to give you that uh, additional level of information. And certainly uh, blocks from a statewide or regional perspective, you want to see the most connected to try to get connectivity you know, across town through the reaches. Um, it's kind of tough when you get felt back in Camden here, but there are ways to maintain uh, connections going up to the north as species move with climate conditions. Is this one of the options online? Yep. So there's multiple benefits for um, thinking about large forest blocks locally. Certainly our forest products industry, if you're going to have functional operations, you know, it's not going to happen on a 30 or 40 acre chunk. You're going to want larger um, blocks of forest. Access for hunting, trapping, fishing. Um, as the landscape gets fragmented with development, more posted signs, of course, follow. Water quality protection. Carbon storage, we're finding more, especially old stands, if there are uh, particular stands in Lincolnville that are 100, 100 plus years, those are critically important. Um, it's only a small percentage of forests on the landscape in Maine currently. Um, <coughs> blocks buffer uh, disturbance sensitive species like wood thrush, like scarlet tanager. Um, barred owls, things like that. The, the, the more fragmented, the more competition there are from generalist species, more predation, um, potentially more invasive species. Uh, groundwater recharge, of course, and I already talked about older forest stands. So some of the tools for protecting those, uh, certainly encouraging use of the um, current tax current use tax programs, both tree growth and open space. Um, I think there's going to be some changes to open space coming through this legislature that should make it a little easier for landowners and, and municipalities to promote that program. Um, overlay zoning to minimize sprawl and fragmentation. What do I mean by that? Uh, there's my town, Brunswick, we did it, and then a few other towns followed where if you pick a block, Lincolnville's priority forest blocks, and you draw an overlay around it, overlay zone in, in your 
um, town zoning map, it's going to include all the owners who own portions of that block in this overlay. And it's not a no development um, overlay zone, but what it does is it sets new performance standards on those lots and it can mandate um, conservation subdivisions with the target of concentrating the houses on the outskirts of blocks of the block and maintaining the interior. It can have a sliding scale um, for how much open, if you have got a landowner with a field out front that he can put the houses in and maintain 100 acres of block out back, you can give him bonus um, lots or you can um, ask other scenarios where they can mitigate by setting interior portions of the forest block aside in a conservation easement for more um, density out front. There's different ways this can work. So that's one tool. Um, dead end road limitations, certainly our fire departments want to see that. <laughs> um, and it helps reduce intrusion into the blocks. Land trust and of course state and federal grant programs as well can help if you what I've found is as towns do open space or conservation planning and they have clear objectives and priorities, once those are on paper, it really paves the way um, for granting organizations to say, hey, this is a identified local priority. We really wanna help these guys out for the good thinking and planning they've done. All right, and then near coastal town, so I'd be remiss if I didn't have a coastal slide. Um, this is another tool that's out there. It's not linked to our website yet. It's uh, with um, Department of Agriculture, Conservation, and Forestry. And this is the sliding uh, sea level rise tool. If you're interested to see what different sea level rise scenarios look like for Lincolnville. And of course, the big one is down here at the peak. Where this yellow, I just clicked on the 10 foot scenario, you know, going for the extreme. And you can see, of course, the high tide line is going to move inland over time. You've already experienced that down along Route 1 in the beach area. And um, planning for keeping future development out of these areas, out of even the most extreme scenario, can help maintain um, intertidal functions in those. It's gonna avoid costs for the municipality first off, but then it will allow as the sea level rise comes in for those areas to transfer maybe over to salt marsh, maybe over to new mud flats for shellfish harvest or for shorebird use, things of that nature. So not a lot of potential in Lincolnville given your sort of abrupt coastline, except where you have the duck trap coming out and down here by the beach where you have that more gradual slope. All right, so to wrap up here, and then we can <coughs> go to questions. Start with your riparian areas, of course. You do a good job buffering those. You've already gotten your um, connectivity across the landscape to an extent. Add in your rare plant and animal significant wildlife habitat protections and ultimately protect some of your large blocks and you can start to see that you will have a resilient landscape that can support native flora and fauna moving forward. And again, the message is not that you have to save everything, but just think functionally on the landscape and start prioritizing um, just like you would for roads, just like you would for growth areas. Um, we suggest beginning with habitat because it's not going to come back once it's lost. One quick question on that last slide. Sure. Building up layers on the map. Is that something you can do online to add and subtract layers? So yep. Can string them together? Yep. And one thing I didn't show, it's in this tube and it's also online, is we do a co occurrence map. And what we do is we um, give each element of the different maps a score. So like say a rare plant species gets one point, a significant wildlife habitat gets one point, block gets one point. Then we, in GIS, start stacking those up and we can unroll those maps and look at it. And then it's sort of, you'll see different various shades of green where the darker the green, the more those landscape values stack up. Again, just to give you a little different perspective on all the data. Probably. I want to see it. Unless 
cell phones certainly didn't work, but it looks like the office here is. Yeah, yeah, I found it. So here's our landing page, and I'm just going to click on maps, and then I'm going to go down to map database, and it's easy, you just search by the letter of your town, and I'm going to go right to the co-occurrence map here. Um, let me go back. So our website basically just search begin with habitat and you'll get to this link. Go there and then um, each tab we have different things. Like here we've got conservation strategies, case studies, um, resources for landowners, land trust, depending on what the toolbox here is, this needs to be updated, but it's basically conservation tools for all different topics. There's documents to help out, things like uh, economic arguments for conservation, if you need that, um, things about significant wildlife habitats, um, a whole variety of things. And here we have you know, if you want more on scarlet bluet, you know, you can go right to various species and see our recommendations for management. Or um, if you want to jump to maps, <coughs> this is the slide I showed you previously with the stream viewer, the interactive map viewer, online map database, um, which is where I was going. And this is, this just has the PDFs of the maps like I had in the tube. So let me jump to co-occurrence. And now you'll see, it's probably tough for where, from where you're sitting, but the orangey lines that are squared off, obviously those are parcels, that's considered land. And then you can see where things start stacking up. difficult to see um, here, but some of the blocks, if they have uh, more diverse areas in them, they'll pop a little greener than others. Um, we also show, which I didn't mention in my presentation, limits of focus areas of statewide ecological significance. Those, we have um, 140 of those designated statewide. Uh, they're based on high concentrations of rare plant and animal occurrences and different natural community types. Of course, Camden Hills is your hometown focus area. Most of that is already conserved. Uh, the state and local partners have done a great job. Um, but we do have, I don't think any others intersect your boundary or this map. But yeah, like I say, those are, oh, here's, yeah, here we go. Um, Ragged and Bald Mountain is another focus area of ecological significance. Um, and then up and down the coast and all the way up into the county, we have other ones designated that you can see online and get fact sheets as to why they're designated. It's not a legal designation. Again, it's a planning tool to try to focus um, state and federal and local um, investment in the best biologically diverse areas. Yep. And Camden is probably state parks. Yes. Yeah, where are the state parks up? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so that's actually outside of the focus area. That's, you know, wildlife management lands and mm -hmm. um, the camp, of course. What else can I show you? 
Sure. Joe Roy. Okay. Yeah. Yes, I mean Chris. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And uh, so, uh, uh, but, but you mentioned uh, Dr. Delando is with significant amounts of land or with stacks of pretty heavy. Uh, I, I told him, what do you all consider significant amounts? Yeah. You know, I guess. You uh, know, right now, anyone with, you know, 40 to 100 acres interested in doing conservation we're willing to talk to it might take us a while to get there we are trying to double that staff now so instead of one it'll be two guys two people um and that should happen soon and then you know anyone on our our staff um there's currently four of us soon to be five we're always willing to come help out locally whether it's working with a landowner or working with the town looking at a piece of property or something like that as are our regional biologists no, I mean we've we've had you know we've had requests from people with six acres, and it's like okay if we're in the area, we'll we'll swing by, but it, you know it doesn't rise to a priority just given the limited staff resources. But certainly it's not out of the question. Do you also use this interactive map? Yep. So let me shut this off and go right to layers. So you can go right down the list of layers here. Start with your important natural resources and habitats. Um, we're still, this is a work in progress, so I certainly encourage as you play around with any of our website resources, if you see things that can be improved, let us know. Uh, we have a Cracker Jack staff, especially when it comes to GIS, me not included, um, that are constantly working to improve these things. But you know, you can zoom right in and you can click on a polygon and it'll go, well, that one's boring one, it's just a wet one. Let's go over here and see what this says. Uh, we're having a problem with watershed divides. So that's something that's where that's the first thing selected. That would be a. So you don't need a special pathway anymore. Nope. Any old so there, there's a trout stream. Um, yeah, it's sort of the second page of that one. Yep. You can click through to more information. Yep. And we're trying to put on all the fact sheets now for the various <coughs> species. Um, we don't have them all loaded. Let's see if I can get one of the damselflies here. Yep, and you can change base maps to imagery here so you don't have to look at the and there you go scarlet blew it and then let's see if that link works yeah that'll just take <coughs> a list of endangered yeah so and like I say ignore these big brown blocks they're going to be disappearing soon <laughs> what happened with these, just so you know, is you see how it says Canada's deer wintering area. Um, we, back in the day, uh, you know, I'll be honest, I think we went overboard in mapping um, softwood cover types, especially in Region B. IFNW is broken up into different regions of various parts of the state. Um, we have a lot of these mapped in Region B, and not many of them are actually functional deer wintering areas. Um, at least not now. So we're going to be removing these from um, our resources because certainly deer management in this neck of the woods, although it's important from a recreational and hunting standpoint, from a biological management standpoint, is not that critical. They're doing pretty well um, without hands-on, unlike down east and up north. Where's that? <laughs> uh, east, west, west, north? South, south, south. Alright. Oops, didn't mean to do that. Don't want Hillsborough. Further west? Here. Yeah. 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 
so those are uh, public supplied drinking wells. So down in there? Oh, that guy. Yeah. Uh, okay. Yep. We need local place names on the map. That would be fun. All right, I think that's is another issue with this is you can only go so far, zoom so far, and we're working on fixing that, but that's as far as I can zoom currently. So you got a lot of layers going on right now. Yep. Yeah, you certainly have a lot going on there. Um, yeah. So we got the Wadenburg, inland Wadenburg waterfowl habitats, the brook trout, of course, on the drainages there. Wetlands, right? Wetlands, yeah. Um, what else is not on here? So anything else I can drill in on or show you? Well, we asked well, to keep that for a reason. Okay. <laughs> I think they have, yes, they have all the riparian habitat off. So yes, that's all brook trout. And a lot of camps on the ponds. And that's going to be the, uh, your sig significant um, inland waiting waterfowl and waiting bird habitat. Yeah, so, you know, conservation efforts. I mean, this stuff already has legal protections, but conservation efforts of any of these connecting blocks would be pretty darn important. You know, one of the things I really like about the map, the map is kind of going through it, and there's a lot of the vegetation that we're able to see from here. So, I think, you know, all these different pools and their spreader, it's great to see it. Yeah, thank you. Um, not necessarily. So, like if you click on this, I believe it's just going to tell you, yes, inland weighted bird and waterfowl habitat. And then it'll tell you, some of these links will give you information about regulatory purposes, things like that. But it doesn't drill in on the species present. Yeah, unless we have known occurrences of species we track, which are rare, threatened, and endangered species. Um, it doesn't mean they're not there. It probably just means that um, state biologists haven't gone in there and inventoried, or we don't have any records from local people that we've pulled into the system. But always happy to add in. If you have local knowledge of different rare community types or just species, we're always happy to add that. Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, there's a very small percentage of the ground in Maine that we've had, you know, boots on the ground doing the actual survey. Yeah, eBird has become a great tool because, you know, it's up to the birders where they log on the site on the map. You can add a site to the map and upload your list um, right there with that point. So it's a, we've been using that for our um, statewide atlasing project we're doing now. Um, and just what you say, it's, it's pretty refined for species that aren't necessarily tracked by our department. Um, but certainly may show up in our species greatest conservation need list. So just to show you this functionality of this again, um, you click on a dot, we assign it an ID, tell it what, you know, what it is, culvert, blah, 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 the brook it's on, town, of course. And then if you want to see actual photos, that's not a Excellent. Are you getting state funding for it, I hope? Well, are you on that committee? Well, I can help, <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. We've applied for some assistance Excellent. This, through the program, and they're waiting anxiously. Right, I'll put, put in a good word. Cool. That certainly doesn't look like it's sized correctly. Uh, <laughs> the fact that last year alone we, we repaired the road twice. Because of, wow. Well, It's amazing what they put in historically, you know, yeah. uh, how much of town budgets go into these, you know, poorly sized culverts. Yeah. And I don't think that one was necessarily poorly sized, but over time, over time yeah. things have occurred upstream yeah. that have enhanced the water level. <laughs> and the front real wide steps and stuff. Oh, great. Question. I did have a question. And, uh, uh, it pertains to the Duck Trout River. And a while back, I don't know, 10 years, 10 years ago, uh, we had a 250 foot setback or 250 foot uh, call it a reef source or potential mm -hmm. reef zone. And then, and I, I talked to David about this, and it, uh, the, and the town was for the purpose of being built to monitor that, to make yeah. sure that that was being adhered to. Uh, but then it changed.
Yes. And now, just as recently, we've seen, oh, it's cleared land right down to that 100 foot, so it's like 100 feet, you know, it's like all the trees have stumped it. <laughs> like, wow, I didn't think wow. this was possible so close to the duck trap. But we paced it, it's uh, probably 100 feet, and the trees there are still, you know, allowing for the shade and all that. But can it ever go back to the 250 without a lot of legal capital? Yeah, I don't know. I'm not familiar with what the source of the 250 was, if that was Duck Trap Coalition working with Atlantic Salmon Commission. I don't know, yeah. you know what the legal basis was. It's too bad it's not anymore. Um, but certainly, I mean, through the resource protection of Maine Shoreland Zoning Law, the municipality certainly has the ability, should it pass town meeting and the whole planning board process and the town select board process, you can certainly exceed um, state minimum. Yeah. and setbacks. That's probably the, I won't say easiest way <laughs> to do it because it's not easy. As you know, local politics is never easy, but um, from a resource standpoint, it certainly makes sense to have more than 100 feet there. Yeah, because 80% of the river is, does have that protection. There's yeah. a Pokemon Clan Trust really that yeah. can, can take property, but, but uh, I was just curious to have because it doesn't seem like there's going to be much movement Yeah, and, and if, know, it's, it's, if it's just one or two landowners, there's always the direct acquisition process, you know, and then restoration grants, Atlantic Salmon, as you point out, is a top priority for uh, DMR and others. So yeah. uh, there could be funding available if you got a willing seller. We say, yeah, yeah we back because I think the town said we don't want to keep this 250 on here and we'll revert back to the state and they're responsible for maintaining that buffer. Yeah, and again, that's our minimum recommendation. Um, it's better than what's in shoreland zoning, which is 75 feet only on below the confluence of two perennial streams. Um, we say 100 on all streams, <laughs> which is more, um, but yeah. It's been pointed out tonight, the more buffer, the better for water quality and habitat. Mm -hmm. Yes? So when you're showing the wetlands in the color, yep. were you talking about, like, not necessarily identified zone of holes, but just kind of when you wander through the woods and they where it's right now? Typical forested water wetlands, water. yeah. I mean, they all have different functions and values. Um, one's, you know, isolated forested wetland basin that's not a vernal pool, you know, has limited functions and values. It's still recharging your groundwater, it's still providing habitat. Um, but where you have groundwater seeps feeding streams, or if you have a vernal pool setting, or, you know, a forested wetland associated with a pond or a significant wildlife habitat, you know, it adds to the functionality of the system. Um, so that's what I was getting at there. And the more and more, even these little isolated forested wetland basins, the more of those you lose on the landscape, the more you lose your natural stormwater capacity. <coughs> and eventually that water is gonna end up in a great pond or down along the coast or in a stream. Um, so they're a natural ecosystem service that it's worth thinking about local protections for. Because DEP is not going to have your back in most cases. <laughs> yeah. I'm happy to, happy to help. One quick question. Yeah. Was it state or federal or what? It was a it was a survey that we conducted out of the city of Chicago or a city of Flint. Um, um, Weird. I don't know. It, it looked like U.S. Fish and Wildlife yes. Service, yes. but I'm not sure. I'm not sure it was exactly. I 
I can uh, give me your email. I can I can look into it and find out. <laughs> yeah, hey, I didn't get a dollar. Yeah, it might be there's a National Fish and Wildlife Foundation as well. Yeah. And they work with federal yeah. wildlife work, but they probably get to do that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. And as you get into the fun of a comp plan and you have any questions or need any assistance, let us know. Um, yeah. Good. Your eyes. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of cases where, you know, we provide the data and then a consultant the town hires charges the consultant to put the data together and put it on maps. And it's like, <laughs> Why charge the town? We'll do it. Well, thanks for coming out on a snowy day. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you for keeping the roads of Lincolnville safe. Thank you very much. Good luck.